It's one thing to have great ideas. It's another to execute on those ideas. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Today we're talking about execution and making your ideas come to life. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. So glad that you're here. You probably knew that you're here. Um, you knew that you're here. Yes, of course you knew you were here. I'm glad that you're here. We're going to talk today with a gentleman named Jim Hewling. We're going to talk about getting things done. We're going to talk about execution with the guy that knows as much about this as anybody. And his name is Jim Hewling. He is a global managing consultant for the four disciplines of execution that practice at Franklin Covey. In his role, he's responsible for the four disciplines methodology, teaching methods, and the quality of delivery worldwide. He's also regularly leading large-scale engagements in this area, as well as serving as an executive coach to a number of senior executives. His career spans four decades of corporate leadership from Fortune 500 organizations to privately held companies, including serving as CEO of a company recognized four times as one of the 25 best companies to work for in America. He holds degrees from the University of Alabama and Birmingham Southern College and serves on the boards of several local organizations, as well as the Siegel Institute for Leadership, Ethics, and Character. He's a husband, father of two, grandfather of three. He's our guest today. His name is Jim, Jim Hewling. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Gosh, what a great introduction. You know, even I was getting a little interested in what I had to say. So thank you, my friend. Sometimes when people introduce me, I say thank you for the introduction introduction that my mother wrote, right? You made um, my day. <laughs> listen, uh, we're going to talk about this book, The awesome. Four Disciplines of Execution. Uh, and especially now, the one that has this little blue stripe across the top that says mm -hmm. second edition revised and updated. Uh, but we'll get to all of that. When you were 10 years old, Jim, uh, you probably didn't say, I'm going to be a CEO. You probably didn't say, I'm going to write a best-selling, uh, a number one Wall Street Journal best-selling book with two editions. Like none of that was on your radar when you were 10, I'm guessing. So my question to you is, tell us about your journey. Like sort of quickly, how did you end up where we are today? Gosh, what a great question. Uh, you know, I've only known you a little bit, although as we said a moment ago, we're already friends, but uh, I was expecting today to be full of unique questions and I love that. So thank you for starting there. Uh, and and you did emphasize the short version because, you know, I'm I'm an older guy, so I could take all day, you know, to go through this. That is not the whole purpose. This is not <laughs> called the Remarkable Journey podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And Kevin, uh, you Although know, that's it is, even uh, a good podcast. Uh, you should have a second podcast, Kevin. It'd be that. Oh, I got uh, My team but, would say that's a bad idea, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I do want to tell you, though, man, I am so honored to be on this podcast. I mean, you're you're world class in the world of podcasts. You're in the top tier. And uh, I feel very special today because I get to have a conversation with you. So thank you. And, and to go right to your question, you know, I have an answer that you may not be expecting. I actually started my life as an artist. Uh, I was a musician. Uh, played in all the rock and roll bands and and worked my way basically through college, singing and playing in bands and and uh, got all out the girls. Of, well, I don't know. You know, there is a song about that, but I won't quote it on your podcast. But the but you know, I had a blast and I literally loved the aspect of expression. Uh, I even uh, after I graduated college, I went and lived in New York for a while, pursued a career for a very short time uh, as a professional singer, and uh, and then really had a life changing moment. And the interesting thing is that life-changing moment, I wanted my life to be about something other than just music. I had a very wise professor who said to me once, if you can do anything other than music and be happy, you should do that. Because the only people who can survive in the arts, because it's a difficult and challenging career, are the people for whom there is nothing else. So, so I made a change, went into business, 
uh, I, I got into what was in those days the emerging field of computer science. Can you imagine? Uh, went back to school, got another degree in computer science, and went on to start what really turned out to be a 43-year career in business, working my way up uh, through the IT ranks. Uh, I became CIO of a couple of world-class companies, huge corporations. I ended up being CEO of a technology company for 11 years. Uh, and then I had another life-changing moment, which really was, in a way, full circle. Because I, I realized after 11 years of being a CEO that that really wasn't what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was communicate. I wanted to have a message. I wanted to make a difference in the lives of people. And, and, and Kevin, I realized, you know, you can make a difference in the lives of people in all professions. I'm not saying that that's the exclusive yeah. territory of writers and speakers. But I really wanted to be doing, well, in a sense, what we're doing today, you know, sharing ideas about things that really matter and finding a way to be helpful to people in the living of their lives. So uh, the end of that story is a, the greatest professional moment of my life. Uh, I had the opportunity to join the Franklin Covey organization, which I had long been a fan of because of the work of Dr. Stephen Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people that he, he had really done what I aspired to do and, and still aspire, I haven't made it yet, Kevin. And now finishing 13 years with the Franklin Covey organization, um, and not finished yet, I shouldn't have said that, but, but this is my 13th well, I, year. I, with I don't think Franklin. anyone heard it that way, but that's fair to clarify. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna say something, Jim, and. Mm. You know, as people listen, I, I often I, I realize that some people are most people are listening and not watching. And if you're yeah, watching, course. hi. Uh, but <laughs> or if you're driving, don't be watching. If you're driving, please don't be watching. I do. Why do we have 12 inch laptop screens and TV in in cars? I do not. I don't think <laughs> it's necessary. Awake at night, though. Yeah. But anyway, um, you said I, I like to sometimes stop and highlight something because I know that people are doing lots of different things when they're when they're listening. And you said something a little bit ago that I thought was mm. marvelous. And and this is not this is also not the remarkable parenting podcast, but you said something that one of your professors said to you that I think that many times parents struggle with. Mm -hmm. They have a child that wants to do something right. that perhaps uh, doesn't look like the odds are all that high about. Right. You this happened to be in the arts. And I love the way this professor, this mentor framed it for mm -hmm. you. Would you just say it again I to would, kind of underline it for everybody? Because mm -hmm. I think it's really powerful. I love this. I'm so glad we're going to talk about this for a second because this is this is a precursor to the execution things that we'll talk about in a little while. But my professor was a Dr. Hugh Thomas at Birmingham Southern College, where I was a music major. It was a conservatory school. And, and I was part of a group of people studying music with the, the intention to be professional musicians. And uh, I'd never forget it. I have chills on my arm right now remembering this moment when he said to a small group of us who were very serious about this, that if you can do anything else and be happy and fulfilled and content, you should do that. Because the only people who seem to be able to endure in the arts are those for whom there is nothing else. And, and Kevin, if you don't mind, I'll tag on to the end of that really quickly, Please. that I think that is not an exclusive statement to the arts. No, I don't the, think so either. Don't that's you think that's right? I wanted you to go back. Yeah. The only people who should be doctors are the people for whom uh, there's there's nothing but healing. That's all I think about. That's all I care about. The people who should be therapists and counselors and and business people are those for whom you know at least that is the driving pull in their life to go to that. Because anything else, dabbling in anything else, I don't. Can I say this as though I as though I really was an authority, even though I'm not? Is uh, number one, if you dabble your way through life, you're never going to be happy never going to be completely happy. And second, you're probably never going to do anything of great significance. So why not find the thing for yourself that is your thing? You know, the thing that makes you want to get up in the morning and do it, that thing. That's That would be a message wouldn't Are it, from you, you and me to everybody. Are you saying perhaps you never would reach your wildly important goals? Perhaps? That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, just saying. Uh, Very so, nice. Very so um, this book, the Four Disciplines of Execution. It's been out for a number of years. And as I said, now you're you're out touring the world of podcasts, yes. talking about it because we're in the second edition. Mm -hmm. I don't have any books that have a second edition. So I, I got a lot to learn here. But I want to ask you this question. So it's been, I don't remember now when the first, I, I, I should have done my homework, gone over to my- 11 years ago. Thank you. I should have gone over here and looked at the original copyright. Um, 
What do you think has led to the success of this book? Yeah, I love this question. And, and I feel my answer now, not just coming from my mind, but maybe coming from my heart as well. Um, Kevin, I think everybody struggles with execution. You know, our, our first edition and second edition are really written with a predominant thought of leaders of teams, mostly in the business or nonprofit segment. But you know, the principles apply to our personal lives, they apply to our parenting, they apply to everything we try to do. So they, they are powerful in that sense. But, but to come back to your question, I think everybody struggles with it. You know, there, there's a reason that New Year's resolutions are a cliche. You tell somebody your New Year's resolution, and they roll their eyes and say, is it February yet? You know, yeah, talk uh, to me uh, on the 20th of January. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. We have a long history of this. So so in other words, this book, the, both the original and even better in the new one, provides what we believe is the best answer we know to why is that and how do I change it? So, OK, so now I have to ask a question. You challenged me to ask questions no one asked you. So, uh, you know, I almost chuckled when I said we're going to talk to an expert on execution because, you know, there's a whole other definition of execution. <laughs> Why did you pick execution instead of implementation? Because I find myself using the word implementation because I sometimes get stuck on that word execution. Yeah, yeah. Is there a Great reason? Question. I'm just curious. Great There's question. Really, obviously, and nothing wrong with the word execution. Oh no, no, I'm of, course not. of course not. If there was a conscious choice there, one or the other. Well, I think there was, and uh, let me—I'll do my best to express it. But do you mind ten seconds to tell you one of my favorite examples? Is I gave a keynote speech on the four disciplines in Bogota, Colombia, and the billboard outside the stadium where I was going to be speaking said Jim Hewling, Chief Executioner. True story, hand to heart. True story. Chief Executioner. So there have been times when I've, I've wondered about this name, but I'll tell you what I like about this. If, for example, we said disciplines, not principles, ideas, practices, and we said execution, not just dabbling. You know, I think it's an edgier word, a stronger word that you go out and you do it. Um, and and not, to, not to say that as a heavy thing for people hearing us, but to say, our book from page one to page 311 is all about getting things done. There's not much fluff in there and there's not much philosophy in there. It's hard edged advice about how to make the things that matter most to you come true in your life or with your team or, or in your business. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the word disciplines. And I bet I bet that you know this, that the root word of discipline uh, is learning. Yes, sir. Under the word dissy, uh, discipline, disciple, uh, mm -hmm. learn. Right. I love that. Yeah. So uh, the four mm -hmm. disciplines of execution, there are only two people, two kinds of people that are listening to us, Jim, those who have read the book and those that haven't. Uh, so we're going to talk about what's in. <laughs> right? Is that a scientific right. fact, what you just that, said? That is a scientific yeah. fact. That's awesome. Uh, now, uh, I also know as an author that there are a bunch of people that have it that didn't read it, but we won't talk about that right now. I, what I want to do is two things. I want I want first for you to tell us about the four disciplines of course. Br briefly, of course, uh, but then I want to talk about what what you changed or what's different. So, but first, what real quickly. For people that haven't or for people that have slept since they read it, what are the four disciplines? You must know me well because you've emphasized three times briefly. And, 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 and I have a history of long answers. So I'm going to actually be true to what you've asked me to do. So there are four of these things. They're easy to remember. And, and for everybody, if you're if you're pausing for a moment, you want to write these down. I'm going to give you a simple way to catch these four ideas. I still would like for you to buy the book if you don't mind. I have grandchildren that are going to college and all that. But 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 I give you the four ideas. It'll only take a second. So. The four disciplines of execution are based on four universal, timeless principles. Number one is focus. So the very first discipline is to focus on the wildly important. And Kevin, I know that's a cheesy name. I've often regretted it myself, but you know, it gets, it gets in the brain. It gets people's attention. And the reason we chose that name is because everything you and I think we're doing right now, we think it's all important. So in order to separate out the thing that matters most, we had to call it something different. It's so wildly important. So, so here's an idea that will hold in the mind better than my words. Imagine every single person listening to this is really like an air, air traffic controller. And whether you're driving your car or you're at work or you're at home making breakfast, you're listening to this podcast, I promise you, you have 100 planes circling your brain right now. There's 10 things your kids need. There's two things your spouse needs. You've got stuff to do at work. You've got stuff to do at home. You've got things you're trying to remember and not forget, but you don't have time to write them down. It's like air, airplanes are everywhere, right? So how do you ever get any of those things to happen? Well, 
the, the principle of discipline one is to separate out the plane that most needs to land now, right? We can't land them all. There are times in the Atlanta Hartsfield airport, I've thought that's what was going on when I've looked out the plane window, but it, but it actually wouldn't work, right? We can only really land one plane at a time with real excellence. And believe me, if you were on that plane, you'd want it to be landed with excellence. So discipline I'll one- I'd rather wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Take your time. <laughs> so discipline one is to identify the one thing you want to do with real excellence that matters most and separate it out from the other 99 planes. Now, just for the record, Kevin, I can't help you with the other 99 planes. That's a different book. There's lots of ways to deal with that. What I want you to be able to do is to know that whatever you've chosen, you are going to do. So separate it out. That's discipline one. That's the discipline of focus. Discipline two is the discipline of leverage. I spent most of my life looking for this di discipline, Kevin, and I had to have my friend Chris McChesney help me to find it. Discipline two says that no matter what goal you've chosen, there are a few human actions that will have more impact on it than all the rest, right? So, so in a very real sense, it's about saying, now that I've chosen the goal, what are the one or two things I could do with consistency and excellence that would have the biggest impact on the goal, right? It's a, it, it is it, what, in a very real sense, you know, the 20% or heck, maybe it's 5%. I don't yeah. know, but it's yeah, the few you know, things. If you, take, if you take the 20, if you take the 20, yeah, 80, yeah. and then you take 80 of the 20, you exactly. got exactly. I'm right five, with right? you. I'm right with you. And believe it or not, that's really been the key to all the success we've had around the world. 300,000 organizations are using this process today. And a big reason is because they finally got this, that I don't have to work harder. I just have to get a lot smarter. I have to know the few things that produce the biggest results. That's why we call discipline two the discipline of leverage. Like if you had a pole and you were able to move a big rock, it's that idea. Small movement creates big results. So that's discipline two. One was focus, two was leverage. Three, the one that's often missed and my personal favorite, I have to, I have to admit it right here on, on a national uh, podcast, uh, is the discipline of engagement. So in other words, discipline three is about how you keep score. It's about, it's about feeling like you are playing a winnable game, like, like achieving this goal could actually be fun. It's not just all grinded out work, right? And it turns out the key to that is how you track your progress. So in other words, if you build what we call a compelling scoreboard, then you will have way more rocket fuel in your engine to pursue discipline one and two than you would have any other way. And this applies now if you've got a team of people building a scoreboard that they rally around and say, hey, that's our board. This is our game we're playing. Or whether it's something that you put on the refrigerator at home and you're marking the days when you stayed on your nutrition plan or you got your 10,000 steps in, doesn't matter. The, the ability of that visual display to compel you to want to play to win is the power of discipline three. Discipline three, keep a compelling scoreboard. And the big one, Kevin, is discipline four. Discipline four, without any question, the most important discipline. In fact, one, two, and three are sort of how you set up a game. Discipline four is how you play the game. Discipline four is the discipline of accountability. And Kevin, what it really means is I need to find a way to make myself personally accountable for my weekly progress. Now, if I'm in a team, I do that by going around the circle and everybody's saying, well, here's what I'm going to do this week. And here's what I'm going to do this week. And, and a week later, we all say to each other, uh, I said I would do it and I did it, or I said I would do it and I didn't. But either way, we become accountable to each other. If I'm at home, I need a buddy. I need to be able to call you, Kevin, and say, hey, can I have 10 minutes every Friday morning? And all I'm going to do is tell you whether I kept my commitment or I didn't. But I need to know Sunday through Thursday that I have to call you Friday morning. If, and if I didn't do it, I don't want to tell you I didn't do it. I need a way to make myself accountable. So that's discipline four. The discipline and oh, by the time. way, you're not going to do that more than about two weeks in a row. So even if well, we miss it one, you're not going to miss it the next one. I'm not. Right? And you're not going to make it easy either, are you? If I've chosen well, the right person, you're going to say, oh, Jim, I thought if I'm serious. a good friend or a good coach. Yeah. I'm not. And, and you know, you coach folks and I coach folks. Yes, and sir. that's half of the value. 
maybe the three quarters of the value right there. It's That's not the right. wise stuff we say. It might be the questions we ask. It's mostly, so how did it go since last week? That's did you right. have that conver- tough conversation? That's right. Did That's you right. implement that strategy you said you were going to implement, right? That's, That's right. what it all comes down to. And Kevin, if you don't mind, I'll slip in there and say, and you know, we try to avoid that kind of accountability. And it's actually the secret to almost everything we want in life. Uh, and a, a quick story on that. I have a, I'm eight years into CrossFit. I just love CrossFit. I'm not going to talk about it much today, but yesterday my CrossFit coach saw me uh, casually rowing the rower, which is not something we do in CrossFit. And as he walked by, he said, uh, he said, I had no idea you were so comfortable with mediocrity. Just like that. Just like that. Right. Well, now some people would say, oh, I don't want that. I loved it because all of a sudden, what do you think I did? I wrote harder. my best. I rode harder. Right. So that accountability brings out the best in us. But we've got to learn to see it as an enabler of excellence rather than a punitive or, or yeah. a punishment kind of process. I often say to people that accountability is the longest four letter word in the dictionary. Like people <laughs> seem to think it's like this bad thing. And be- because yeah, as leaders, we say, well, I have to hold them accountable. I don't want to hold right. them accountable. I say, no, what you need to do is help them be accountable. That's and right. what you're talking about and what the book talks about is how to help people be accountable, to see the value so that they're ready for that. And we're doing that together. I mean, that what you just said is powerful. You know, the accountability that's outside in, that's, that's all your authority imposed upon me. I, I don't want to disillusion anybody listening to us today, but that's really the smallest tool in your toolbox. It's not very effective. But yeah. the accountability that's inside out, that comes from the fact that I want to get better. I want to do a good job. And in the language of 40X, I want to win. That kind of accountability, every champion, every every person who's done something great in the world, every person who's reached the best level they were capable of, they had that inside out kind of accountability. So uh, as we're having this, con- no one else is going to hear this for a while, but as we, what just happened in our world as we're having this conversation in late May is that Phil Mickelson won yes. a major at age 50. No one, no one held him accountable to that. Simone Biles just did this amazing thing, jumping. Yeah, you know. and nobody's no ever, ever done, done before. before. No one held, no one held her to that accountability. Right. In fact, but let's th- go but further. Someone helped both of them. Yeah, and if somebody had said to Phil Mickelson, "You have to win this year," it wouldn't have had the same effect as him saying, "I'm going to win this year." Yeah, that's the totally difference. Different. All right, so all right, so you wrote this book, sold a bunch of copies, three hundred thousand companies using it, uh, and then you updated it. So yeah. give me. Like, what did you change? Yeah, yeah, great question. So from, first of all, for context for your listeners, from point A to point B is about 10 years. And in those 10 years, we weren't sitting back counting how many copies, you know, left Amazon every single day. We were out implementing this process all over the world with all those companies that you just mentioned. So we had the chance to learn firsthand, shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart with leaders around the world in some of the world's greatest companies using the process, seeing what worked, seeing what didn't work, seeing what was clear from the book, what wasn't clear, what we thought was clear, but it, it sure wasn't, you know. And uh, and then we began also to learn something we didn't know. And this brings me to the answer to your question. What's really different in the second edition? Uh, first of all, we've tightened up the writing a little bit. We got a lot better at writing in the, the 10 years. But what's really there that wasn't there before is this emphasis on leaders of leaders. Now, i just give you a tiny context. The first edition was predominantly written towards the leader of a frontline team. So, you know, those wonderful individuals, whether it's a team of five or 500, that everybody who reports to you is basically an individual contributor. So that's the first book. In the second edition, we kept all of that, but we added 30 percent new content, all directed toward people who have that unique job. And I saw this on your face, Kevin. You know what I'm talking about. The leading of leaders is an entirely different discipline. And even though there are 80 million books on leadership in the world, there really aren't any that we know of about leading leaders. That's a unique skill. So that's what we added in. We kept everything from the first, but we added in this this 30 percent section on leaders of leaders. What do they do to help people achieve great results? I love that. So. You maybe kind of answered this a little, 
Okay. <laughs> Four disciplines. Well, you told us what our, your favorite is. And oftentimes authors don't want to do that. They'll say, know, well, they're all my children, blah, blah, blah. But you <laughs> picked your favorite. I love that engagement. The third one, uh, mm-hmm. you know, compelling scorecard. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I, yes. which of the four across all of the experience over all those years are people doing the poorest or least oh my consistently? Gosh. Yeah, and, and I think you are not going to believe this, except that I hope you trust in me to tell the truth. Do you know it's discipline one? You know, everybody in the world thinks they're focused. And, and sometimes focus is just a pseudonym for busy, right? Uh, I got, I'm so focused these days. I can't believe how focused I am. I focused on 37 things today, you know? Well, if you focused on 37 things today, you really didn't focus on any of them. You, you know, you may have touched 37 points throughout the end of your day, but you didn't give any of them the very best you had or the quality time needed to get to a level of depth or excellence. So you, you may think you did, but you didn't. And, and you know, um, I bet we could do a podcast, we won't today, on multitasking. Multitasking is the greatest lie ever told. It's a to myth. We, we, we don't have to have a <laughs> conversation about that because it doesn't exist. It doesn't, but people think it does. You know, they think I can be reviewing a report, listening to a phone call, eating a cheeseburger, driving my car all the same time. And I got it. I got them all handled. And it's just not true. So well, hold, when hold we on. come, hold on, stop right there, Jim. So a lot of you who are listening right now are trying, are listening to us while you're doing something else. And that's fine. But you know, the most you're going to get from this, the very most is yeah. 70% of it. Oh, oh, you're the so optimistic. Most. Yeah. What a kind right? guy you well, are. I right? mean, the research says the very best you can do at any two things is 70% of each yeah. varies widely. So the very, very, very best you could possibly do. And if you're a woman, the odds are you might do it a little better than a man. That's what the research says. But the reality is, if 70% is good enough, you go for it. And if you move that to three things, you're probably down in the 25% effectiveness level. So I'll, I'll tell you something I believe with all my heart, and I don't mean offense to anybody. Habitual multitaskers, to me, are great candidates for mediocrity. That's really what you're saying is, if you're gonna try to do five things at once and call that focus, if you feel you have to do that, then you know you have to do what you think you have to do. But you're never going to do your best at any one of those five things or even any one of those three things. So believe it or not, focus is the one that people struggle with the most. And part of the reason is they think they're already doing it. They're like, hey, well, Jim, we can skip this one. Can you go right to discipline two? Because we got this focus. We have 25 goals here for our team. <laughs> yeah, which means yeah. you don't have it. You right? got no you goals. 25, you got zero. Exactly. Zero. Exactly. Um, so, uh, man, I might have to have you back, Jim, sometime, but, but I I, I gotta ask, is there something that we didn't talk about that you Mm. wish we would have, or thought I'd have asked or wish I would have asked? Mm. Well, I'll say it and I, and I don't need to apologize with you, but it's a little bit uh, philosophical, which is simply to say, um, I've been in leadership a long time. I've been a leader of leaders for a long time. I've done it well sometimes and not well at other times. But I've come to the conclusion that the vast majority of the leaders in the world are leading almost exclusively from their authority and from their mind. You know, in other words, if I can be really clear about what I want you to do and I can I can make sure, you know, there are consequences if you don't do it. That's leadership. And that's really what goes for leadership along around the world. And I just want to tell everybody, if that's what you're doing, you're only tapping 30% of a human's potential because the other 70% doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. And so keep your authority, keep your clarity, but add to it a sense of purpose. Add to it the sense that you actually care about them as individuals, not, not as product producing you know, machines. And, and, and give people a sense that they're part of something that matters and you'll get both the mind and the heart. You'll get a set of results you wouldn't even imagine. But you ha- to do that, you have to engage. You have to, you have to be a little vulnerable. You have to be authentic. You have to have some empathy uh, for the human beings who are following your leadership. If you do it, I promise you, it's worth it. That's the one thing we didn't say that I'm glad you gave me a chance to say. It is so worth it. Leadership is not a power grab. Uh, you try to grab it, you'll have less and less of it trying to squeeze onto water. Um, it's, you, you got it, man. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, so you told us CrossFit already. We know that you're a musician, at least you once were. Uh, what do you do? What else 
do you do for fun? Besides CrossFit, <laughs> what else do you do for fun? Yeah, it's, it, it's the old joke is CrossFit people only want to talk about CrossFit, but but I have lots of other things in my life. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm at the moment I'm building an, a digital course to help people find the work they were meant to do in their lives, and I'll come out later this summer. It's just a side project, and it's just a thing I'm doing to try to have an impact on the world. You know, and I, and I have a, a my sweetheart of 40 years, uh, still enjoying every single day. Lots more time at home than we were before. Uh, and loving every minute of that. And I've got, of course, two kids and three great grandkids. And, and my life is incredibly rich and, and full. So I, I thank you with that. And, and the one thing I didn't talk about really was, uh, was about I love to read. I, I'm an avid reader. You and I were talking about this a moment ago. So so when I'm not uh, on a podcast and when I'm not working for Franklin Covey uh, or with my family, the only other thing you'll probably find me doing is sitting on the back porch of my house reading a another book and trying to uh, raise my own game and right, open my mind. Yeah. All right. So tell us something you're reading. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh, we were, we just had a little conversation about that before. And uh, I am right now, uh, I'm, re I'm rereading a book that I've read 10 times. I want to tell you that. And I'm reading a new book that I've never read before. So the book I'm rereading, I've read 10 times, is a book called The Alchemist. Uh, I feel certain that you've heard of it. Uh, I have, Kevin, I've almost bankrupted myself giving away copies of The Alchemist to people. I've only, I, I'm way behind. I've only read it twice. It's life changing. It's a, it's a, it's an allegory. It's a story that teaches. So if you're not, if you don't like that kind of book, this is not for you. But the depth of those teaching moments in that book, I, I just think they're simply profound. And so uh, I encourage everybody to, to take a look at that. And then uh, the other book that I'm reading now that I started and didn't finish, and now I've come back to finishing it but because I had to stop to absorb it, uh, is a book called Atomic Habits. Um, I hope you've heard of it. I, I think James Clear is just one of the most incredible voices in the world today. And even though he writes about things that are very similar to ours, uh, his book and our book are very harmonious. You know, ours is sort of the organizational version and his is sort of the personal version. But I think this guy's brilliant and the simplicity, he makes everything so simple. So if you're looking for a companion book, maybe to Four Disciplines, I think Atomic Habits is a wonderful, wonderful, it's, it's one of my favorite books of all time I'm reading right now. And uh, I don't know if you mind me mentioning this, I hope you don't. Um, I have read about three books a month for the last 41 years, literally. I actually have a list of all the books I've ever read. And people ask me all the time, Kevin, if it's, if it's uh, uh, you know, what's the, what are the books that have impacted you the most? And if you don't mind, I have a document, I have a list of the 16 that have impacted me the most. May I give it to you and anybody who's interested in it, you could maybe make it available to them. Yeah, we we talked about this before I hit the record button mm -hmm. and we'll, we're we're going to put that on the, you're going to give awesome. it to me I'll and then we're going to have it in the show notes here. So whether awesome. you've, whether you're, if you're, wherever you're listening, you can go find the show notes or you can go to remarkablepodcast.com and you can go find this episode awesome. and then you can watch us a second time <laughs> if you want to, uh, but we'll have the link to that there as well as the link to the Alchemist Atomic Habits and the four Beautiful. disciplines. Wow. Of Thank execu you. Execution. Wow. What, what, what an awesome podcast. What, where do you want to point people? Uh, I'll hold the book up, but where do you want to point yes. people? How can people learn more about you? Connect with you? What do you want to tell people? Absolutely. Two things real fast. Uh, 4dxbook.com, 4davidxraybook.com. That's Franklin Covey's place for the all things about the 4DX book. Please go there. Lots of videos, lots of testimonials. Uh, you will see my partner, Chris McChesney, who's a far better speaker than I am. So you'll get a chance to see a real professional there as well. I hope you do. And if you have any interest in me and the things that I'm involved in, uh, in Four Disciplines and Beyond, jimhewling.com, J-I-M-H-U-L-I-N-G.com. Com. Easy to remember, I hope. And uh, by the way, I'm on every social media platform in the world. And just about every day I put out a thought about leadership or about life that I hope in some small way makes a difference. And so if you follow me on any social media, I'm on all of them. Uh, almost every single day, you'll see at least a little thought from me and check them out and let me know what you think. All right. Uh Jim, thanks. Don't go quite yet, everybody. But I have a question now. I'm done asking questions of Jim. I got a question for all of you. If you've been here before, you know what question I'm going to ask you. Are you ready? Now what? What are you going to do? What action are you going to take as a result of this? Because at the end of the day, well, it, if, if you've enjoyed the last 30 plus minutes as much as I have, then you've been entertained. But you didn't come to be entertained. You came hopefully to be edified. But edification doesn't end with the information. It ends with the application. And so your task 
now is to say, what did I get? Maybe I need to go back and think about the fact that I have, that I'm doing too much multitasking. Maybe you need to go back and say, I'm not, where is the leverage for me and my team? Maybe you need to go back and think a little bit more about accountability, maybe in a more helpful way for you. Maybe you need to find someone to help you be more accountable. There's plenty of things, plenty of nuggets that you could take from this as a parent, as an individual, as a leader, as a human being. The challenge is to take some action. So I leave you with that question I ask you every week, and that is, now what? Uh, Jim, thank you for being here. It was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, my friend. And uh, do you mind if I just say real fast, I'm on a lot of podcasts. You are amazing. You ask <laughs> insightful questions. You keep things moving. I mean, this this has got to be one of the top podcasts in the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm so privileged to have been on it today, Kevin. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate that and very much. And uh, uh, if you are a, someone who listens to this podcast and you agree even halfway with Jim, tell somebody else, uh, go give it five stars wherever you happen to listen. Uh, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, and, and let me just close by telling you all that this episode was brought to you today by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each month we release a new skill in an advanced form of a masterclass designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. You can get all the details on how to get on board with a specific course or uh, get discounts every month by going to remarkablemasterclass.com. And uh, we'll be here next week as we are every week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I hope you'll join us then. Thanks.